Hello and welcome. My name is John O'Sullivan. I'm president of the Danube Institute in Budapest, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our latest Danube podcast. Our topic today is a big one, namely the United States of America. Uh, Our title is, What's Going On in America? And if I'm permitted a little latitude, I might even call it, What the Hell is Going On in America? Because in the last year, the United States has been roiled by an extraordinary succession of disturbances. Last year was, of course, an election year. And so there was inevitably and reasonably the usual partisan disputes between Democrats and Republicans, between supporters of President Trump and the several Democratic opponents in the primaries, from which eventually emerged Joe Biden as the party's presidential nominee. Those disputes were often heated and passionate, but they were also par for the course, normal electioneering. What were more alarming were two other elements. First, the riots that began in Seattle and Portland and eventually spread across America. Those riots led to the disturbances, um, the destruction of buildings, the destruction of small business enterprises, the turning of large tracts of urban America into wastelands, brutal attacks on innocent people, and as many as 30 deaths. The second was an unprecedented level of bias in the mainstream media and the social media against a sitting president to the point of failing to report legitimate news stories that might um, help him. Nor did this catalogue of disasters cease when Joe Biden was elected president by a substantial majority. Mr Trump contested the result alleged the election had been stolen, and a group of his supporters rioted in Washington, invaded the U.S. Capitol, and in some cases assaulted police and other officials. Controversies over all these events are still continuing into 2021. Were the Capitol events merely riots or a full-scale insurrection? Did the Lord treat the Portland and Seattle rioters more leniently than the Capitol demonstrators? And now new controversies are inevitably emerging um, over immigration, economic policy, US-China policy, and the new policies of the Biden administration. We're very fortunate in having two distinguished commentators to discuss these events. Stephen Hayward is the author of several major works on American politics and political theory, in particular a two-volume history of the Reagan administration. He teaches at Berkeley University in California, is a fellow of the Claremont Institute in Southern California, and writes frequently for the American media in newspapers like the Wall Street Journal. He will speak first on the general topic, what is going on in America. Thomas Majerich will respond to his remarks. Professor Majerich is perhaps the most distinguished Americanist in Hungarian academic life. He has also served as a Hungarian diplomat abroad, most recently as ambassador to Ireland. And he is my colleague as uh, editor-in-chief of both the Hungarian Review and the Hungarian Conservative magazines. We are fortunate indeed to have such a lineup. May I now invite Mr. Hayward to address the topic. Thanks very much for the kind invitation to address your audience today. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to be here, I must say. My first visit to Hungary ever. Uh, I hope the first of many. Um, And it was John who suggested when I proposed coming over for a visit that I take on the question, I didn't say what the hell is going on in America, but uh, uh, that question, I can assure you, is on the minds of a lot of Americans right now. Uh, And so it's not just a question for Americans or America's friends or enemies abroad. And I want to take, if I can, a broad view of a few key things. I I can't really cover that much of the territory because it's very extensive. And then ultimately I want to draw back to some things that I think that America has in common with Europe at the moment. So that it will be uh, relevant to uh, the things you're thinking about here. And uh, I'm going to begin from a little bit of a personal perspective. I'm, you know, late middle age now and starting to hear the distant footbeats of old age creeping up on me. And I'm told that there are two things that happen to you as you get older. The first one is your hearing starts to go. And I can't remember what the second one is. Um, Actually, of course, it's your memory, right? And 
as you age, uh, even if you forget where your car keys are, uh, your historical consciousness, your historical memory should grow more acute. Uh, and, you know, uh, you get to uh, you know, my age and older, you now have a lot of direct recollections, even if it's from a very young age, of things that are now entering the history books. And you can read about what people say and think about them and say, that's not how I remember it, or that's not how it should be understood, and so forth. I should like to say, by the way, that some of my own thoughts about historical consciousness, historical perspective, are inspired in part by the great Hungarian-born historian John Lukács. Some of you may be familiar with him. Uh, I was lucky enough to get to know John a bit uh, in America through our mutual interest in Winston Churchill that brought us together on a number of occasions. He wrote several fine books about Churchill and other subjects. So what I propose to do then is a very short history lesson, though I think a little bit different than you may have heard it put before. So my summary answer to the question, what is going on in America, is pretty short and simple. America is having a nervous breakdown. Uh, now, it has happened before, though. Uh, as I say, an awful lot of things happening right now, you know, riots in the streets, uh, unrest, uh, cr crime rising, uh, volatile and peculiar elections. The 1968 election was very strange. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, an economy that suddenly incomprehensible in some ways. This looks very familiar. And a lot of this happened in the 1960s and into the 1970s. In fact, in some respects, in the 1960s, we're much worse than today. As you all know, we suffered from several uh, political assassinations in the 1960s. And our urban riots and unrest went on for several years. It wasn't just one summer, uh, four or five years in a row. And then less well recalled today, even in America, is that starting in the late 60s, we began to have a wave of bombings, mostly on a small scale, but some more substantial, with many people killed. Uh, and that's not happening right now. And let us hope we do not have a return of assassinations uh, or bombings. Uh, one other thing that's not widely recalled today anywhere is that uh, the campus unrest that you saw in the 60s in America wasn't just limited to American campuses. For some reason, there were substantial student uh, protests and even some rioting on campuses all over the world, in South America and Asia in Europe, including even some Eastern European communist countries, although I'm not sure if that happened here in Hungary or not. Uh, and, of course, in America, the protest on campuses was thought to have been uh, agitated by opposition to the, the conscription for the unpopular war in Vietnam. But that can't have been the cause of campus protests elsewhere. There must have been something else happening. Let's see if we can't answer that puzzle in due course here. Um, but in every other respect, things look very familiar. We seem to be repeating the 1960s, although there are a couple of ominous differences that I'll draw out. Now, to the extent that you know, strange and contingent events in history are always the turning points in history that set things in a different direction, it's worth noting one parallel. Uh, there's good reason to propose that the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963 quite simply caused the American left to go out of its mind. Uh, it takes a while to play out this whole story, but I'll just summarize it by saying it didn't happen instantly. But over the next several years, uh, people on the left in America um, really changed their outlook in very important ways. It's still today, for example, an article of faith among American left liberals that somehow it was the American right or some culture of violence and hate that caused the assassination of President Kennedy when in fact he was killed by a dedicated communist. He was a victim of the Cold War. And from there you can look at the descent of the American left into conspiracy theories, into paranoia, and finally culminating in a disenchantment with America itself. We began to hear a critical language that's now very familiar to us in America and elsewhere about there's something systemic wrong with America and with the West as a whole. You could say, to use the popular phrase, that uh, the American left suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder because of Kennedy's killing. And then, of course, that only deepened in the next few years when the president's brother was assassinated, and Martin Luther King, and so forth. Now, one result of this in America was the birth of what called itself the new left, which distinguished itself from the old left of the popular front in the communist days of fellow traveling in the 1930s and 40s. And the new left started a little earlier, I think, in Europe, and maybe you could say that things that start in Europe eventually take hold root in America 10 years later. I'm not sure. But uh, the new left uh, um, 
was, I think, largely unsuccessful in America, except for one important thing that we'll dwell on in due course. But one of its um, principal and deeply cynical purposes was to try to shed the baggage of a connection of, of sympathy with the Soviet Union. And this uh, attempt was wholly insincere. I mean, the far left in America, despite the fact that they would pay lip service to condemning the Soviet Union, which they were liberated to do by the famous Khrushchev speech at 54, 56, whatever year that took place, uh, you know, they couldn't help themselves because, you know, by the time you got to your second cup of coffee, they were saying how great Cuba is, or later Nicaragua. And they still do say that about Cuba, right? They're very confused about things right now. Um, but this, so this practical imperative, which I think really kept the new left from catching on more widely, uh, uh, did require them to invent some new ideological doctrines and new methodology. And as I'll explain in a moment, the new left in America, and I think the new left in Europe, they're very similar, they were much more radical than classical Marxism. I think many of you are familiar with this. In a nutshell, uh, culture rather than economics, they thought, uh, uh, was the new main battlefield in political life, not class consciousness, not union organizing, and all the traditional things the old left did. And as I say, though, it didn't really succeed in American politics very much. In some ways, they did. Uh, they did go to ground in American universities, and then over the next two decades, proceeded to ruin American universities. And that was the great British historian Paul Johnson in his book, Modern Times, who described this period in America as America's suicide attempt. And I think it's correct that by the end of the 1960s, and even more so by the 19, uh, in the 1970s, America's self-confidence was uh, as shaky as its economy. And of course, as is well known, we did largely recover from most of those difficulties in the 1980s and 1990s. Whereupon the most astonishing and happy event of all occurred, well known to all of you, the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union dissolved. I say that's a happy occasion, uh, but when that happened, the most catastrophic intellectual error since perhaps the French Revolution took place. While we were celebrating all that, um, the popular idea caught on, now pretty much abandoned, but I think many of you will remember it, that the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union meant that we had reached the end of history. It's most as mostly associated with the American thinker Francis Fukuyama, but he was channeling Hegel directly, he said so, uh, that we had arrived at the final ideological development in uh, human society where liberal democracy, individual freedom, and open markets were the universal future of human societies everywhere on the planet. Totalitarian ideologies that had brought so much ruin and war to everyone had been decisively defeated. Or so we thought. No one perceived at the time that exactly the opposite is true. What we did not perceive is that, in fact, the struggle for the preservation of Western civilization had actually entered a new and more dangerous phase. And here's why I think that. I think that the end of the Cold War, paradoxically, emancipated the utopian left from the suspicion of an affinity with a foreign enemy. Now, this emancipation did not happen all at once. Uh, by degrees, the new left began to reemerge from its academic uh, uh, bunkers, armed with a new vocabulary that's nonetheless based on the same philosophical premises as Marxism. There are a lot of milestones and markers that are worth mentioning, but I only have a few minutes. Um, uh, um, but as always in human affairs, it's particular and surprising events that propel things forward, like the Kennedy assassination in 1963. So now, fast forward from the era of the 60s and 70s to last year, when, as everyone knows, the world saw the death of a troubled black man at the hands of the police, which at an instant touched off a wave of mass protests and rioting, some of which spilled overseas, uh, as you may well know. And like the Kennedy assassination, this, the seemingly random event inflamed the left, which, I like to say, was already suffering from traumatic stress disorder from the election of Donald Trump, a few years before, and things have been building for a while. This didn't all just start a year ago, but that flipped a switch and put it into a higher gear. And the first and most evident effect of this, uh, of this uh, event last year is the moral panic that set off in America, that somehow all of America's past efforts to remediate our troubled racial history were worthless and contemptible. 
And this moment, as I say, was a long time in coming. It's one thing to argue that America's efforts at racial reconciliation and remediation have been insufficient and unsuccessful, and therefore that the long civil rights movement in America is incomplete. It's one thing to say that. That's not the main argument now about it in America. The new dogma of what has been summarized, I think a little too crudely and narrowly perhaps, but still with a great deal of accuracy, it's summarized as critical race theory. It's now the phrase that's heard everywhere, is that uh, it, it begins with a rejection of the entire civil rights movement, its historical principles, its history, root and branch. So, as I say, this phrase, critical race theory, is thrown around rather loosely and imprecisely, but whatever version or definition you settle upon, uh, racism now has an entirely different meaning. It no longer has much to do with what we used to call racial prejudice, that is, you know, an unreasonable unre deprecation or hatred of other human beings based only on their race and ethnicity. Today, racism is said to be unconscious, subconscious, systemic. Uh, and a moment's reflection should make you realize that the premise that something is unconscious and systemic is identical to the old classical Marxist idea of false consciousness. Not to mention the related uh, concept that our system is the result of sub-rational material forces. And so we now have this strange uh, circumstance where if you ask some of the leading advocates of critical race theory, so is everybody a racist or every, you think some individual am I a racist? So, oh no, no, we don't mean any particular individual. Uh, so in the circumstance in which everything everywhere is racist, but no one individual is a racist. No one has any responsibility for the system that's amorphous and vague in the handling of it. Now, if you point out the defects and contradictions and incoherency of all of this, you're, now talk about a new vocabulary. You're accused of logocentrism. That's one term that's used. There's a whole lot that get used. But I like logocentrism. What does that mean? Uh, emphasizing the centrality of speech and words and reason and rationality. Uh, and in fact, some critic, leading critical race theorists go as far as to reject the Enlightenment itself. And one way in which the current left differs from the old left or classical Marxism is its insistence that no reason need be given for why it's correct. It's openly anti-philosophical and anti-rational. And sometimes they'll say even the idea of objectivity uh, should be questioned and rejected. That's usually the, uh, uh, the ground of someone who knows they're going to lose an argument with you if they have an argument with you. So they don't want to have an argument. You know, sometimes you'll hear in America and elsewhere, I suppose, that uh, our universities are hotbeds of Marxism. And I always sit back and say, I wish that were true. Um, say what you will about the massive errors of Marxism. And, you know, I went to college in the 70s when there were a lot of classical Marxists still around. You could have an intelligible argument with a Marxist. I mean, Marxism at least gave an, a, a rational and seemingly scientific account of how the world works. Today's new left successors have no need to establish that kind of rational foundation. Don't take my word for this. You can, as the saying goes in journalism and elsewhere, you can look it up. Um, so let me give you one example from a widely used book called Critical Race Theory and Introduction, widely used in college classes now, published by Oxford University Press. Um, co-authored by Richard Delgado. Here's one passage. Unlike, quoting here, unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. Let me give you another author, Kimberly Crenshaw, who wrote the following passage way back in 1990. This has been coming along for a long time in academia. In fact, someone wrote in the satire what I was working on in a serious article I didn't get a chance to finish, that critical race theory might be thought of as a gain-of-function virus in an academic lab that's been loosed on the world. You obviously understand the, the parallel here. Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, uh, article on this from 1990, quote, Critical race theory draws upon several traditions, including post-structuralism, post-modernism, Marxism, feminism, literary criticism, liberalism, and neo-pragmatism, and discourse of self-determination such as black nationalism and radical pluralism. 
The, the work is thus aggressively interdisciplinary. Now, when I hear a long list of things like that that are so disparate and then saying this is interdisciplinary, I think what it realizes is anything handy off the shelf that can serve a political agenda. Um, and then she added one last quote, the normative stance of critical race theory is that massive social transformation is a necessary precondition of racial justice. Now, what massive social transformation evolved is never defined, although it does turn out now and then if, you, if someone ever gets specific, they will usually say the abolition of private property. Where have I heard that before? Right? Uh, now, if you, like I say, you, uh, you'll get attacked for saying these kinds of, uh, of criticisms. And uh, I will add that, that um, there's an odd turnabout here. If you go back just really 30 years ago, but certainly back to Edmund Burke, uh, I would say that a lot of conservative philosophers, at least, were skeptical of a lot of the legacy of the Enlightenment. You know, worried that rationality would lead to nihilism, and uh, there are lots of things you can look at. The Marx, for example, uh, even if most conservatives uh, uh, agreed with some of the things that came out of the Enlightenment, like liberal democracy, social contract theory, individual rights, and so forth. Uh, today, and it was always the left that championed the Enlightenment because it was the foundation of progress and science. Today, I think the places have almost entirely changed. Today, I think it's fair to say that the, the radical left everywhere is now the chief opponent of the Enlightenment. And suddenly, it's conservatives like me who are saying, not so fast, that maybe we should, uh, we're going to have to defend the Enlightenment from the people who want to tear the whole thing down, the good parts along with other parts that are more contestable. Um, so, as I say, uh, the dogmas of the new left were confined to college campuses in the 60s and 70s, but today, and here's one big difference with that era 50 years ago, today the new dogmas have penetrated deeply into every corner of American life, all of our cultural institutions and corporate boardrooms. Some people use the phrase woke capitalism, uh, but I think uh, uh, the, the, the racial question that dominates the headlines and is the most uh, visible uh, uh, aspect of the political controversy going on in America. I think that's just one aspect of something deeper. And so now let me draw your attention briefly to another small but very telling example of what is going on on a deeper level. So our new administration recently put out their budget for the next year. It's several thousand pages long. A, a government that spends several trillion dollars has to have a detailed budget that's several thousand pages long. That's a necessity. Uh, the new budget, Throughout the document, the word mother or mothers no longer appears. Even though we have programs that have mothers in their title, or used to until now, they're changing the name of all those programs from mother to birthing persons. As I say, you can, I'm not making this up. Now, I'm so old that I can remember when women's rights were a leading cause of Western liberals. And I suspect the cause of women's rights around the world are still high in the hierarchy of the liberal left. But for the postmodernists walking and talking amongst us today, strictly speaking, it seems there are no women. How can it be for women's rights when there are no longer any women? And this may extend ultimately to human rights too. And that's because there is no human nature. In fact, the phrase human nature has become highly controversial. Uh, and, and college campuses is now often called a form of hate speech. I know of one spectacular example of a president of a major American university who, uh, at Iowa State several years ago, who felt herself compelled to apologize to the student body because she had used the word human nature in her convocation address, welcoming new students. And enough students got upset and complained about the phrase that she, the next day, issued a campus-wide apology. That's where we are. I recall an episode from Abraham Lincoln who once asked the question, if you call a tail a leg, how many legs does a dog have? You'd say, five. And Lincoln said, no, the answer is still four, because calling a tail a leg does not make it a leg. Because there is a such thing as nature and human nature. Now, you can imagine, I, I, I occasionally take the risk in college classrooms. I'm actually at UC Berkeley as an inmate of sorts. Uh, I take the risk of telling that Lincoln story without drawing out its full implications just to see if I can get away with it. Um, so this rejection of nature, and especially human nature, the very idea of objective reality, 
uh, it goes by various descriptions, uh, uh, you know, radical subjectivity, moral relativism, uh, or my, I just prefer plain old nihilism, and it's been around for a long time. And all of this fuels what Roger Scruton has aptly summarized as the culture of repudiation. It's no longer sufficient for this new left to give a, a strong critique of ex the existing social order. Uh, instead, or of our institutions and laws and so forth, that's one thing. Uh, but today, everything old and inherited must be torn down indiscriminately. So uh, it was utterly predictable that what began as a movement a few years ago to remove statues of Confederate generals and Confederate war leaders, there's a good case for doing that, really, but OK. Uh, uh, but it didn't stop there, of course. Before long, protesters were staring, tearing down statues of Frederick Douglass, the great anti-slavery leader, black leader of the 19th century, other lesser known people, because they don't measure up to current dogmas. Actually, I think most of the people doing this are utterly ignorant of what Frederick Douglass thought and said, but they just think it's a statue out there that somebody else put up, we should tear it down. Uh, it, statues of Winston Churchill in England have been defaced. Uh, it's not just an American thing. You may have heard that the San Francisco public schools uh, started the process until COVID came along and gave an excuse to back away from it, but they were going to rename George Washington Elementary School, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson High School, and Abraham Lincoln Middle School. So that's where we've gotten to. <clears throat> now, it would take several weeks in the classroom for a patient and thorough analysis of all the layers of wrongness, but I have just a few more minutes, and I want to draw back from the controversies in the United States and take in the wider view, because as I say, this culture of repudiation is spread everywhere, and talk a little bit about the foundation of a remedy or a resistance to it. <clears throat> I, I noticed a few months ago, with great ironic pleasure, I must say, when the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, and a number of senior French officials very publicly said that certain American dogmas, including in particular critical race theory, should be kept out of France, that they were a threat to France, uh, and could we please keep them out of his country? Now, I'll add, by the way, in passing, that about four years back, I think three, four years back, Macron gave a very interesting interview to Der Spiegel, the German magazine, where he said, among other things, postmodernism has been a disaster for European politics. He didn't expand on the thought very much, but I thought that was very interesting, quite unexpected. Certainly quite unexpected for Americans to hear this. As I say, I took ironic pleasure from Macron saying, please keep American radical dogmas out of France. Uh, but I was also a bit annoyed because, where did some of these ideas come from? Yes, that's right, from you know, French linguistic philosophers. Uh, and although it's true that there's no bad European idea that Americans can't make worse, uh, I would like it if uh, President Macron at least did a glance in the mirror <laughs> before he made those kind of comments. But still, I think that's an interesting uh, aside, and I know he's doing it for some political reasons. There's one other straw of the wind that jumped out at me back in the fall. Uh, the New York Times, who, by the way, reported Macron's comments with a great deal of puzzlement and astonishment, also had a long feature story about Chinese liberals. Now, I mean, when you say Chinese liberals, you mean liberals in the old classical sense. Uh, the right understanding of liberalism, not the confused version we have in America and elsewhere. And with all the, and, and a lot of these are dissident figures. Many of them may well be in jail now, I'm not sure. This is six, eight months ago. And the New York Times was curious that they all like President Trump. All these are intellectuals, right? So the Times is baffled. Why is this? And they all said the same thing. Because we remember our cultural revolution and we see it happening in America. And we think that it would be a great mistake please don't do that. And Trump may be all the things people say about it, but right now is the only person standing in the way of that. Uh, so in other words, they're saying, things are bad enough in China already. Please, America, don't make it worse. Now, as I say, I've only scratched the surface here of the full dimensions of America's nervous breakdown. It would take a while to go through all of it in, uh, um, in, in uh, an adequate way. Uh, so just one thought about how to think about opposition to this. Now, I used to repose more optimistically than I should have in the axiom of the Roman poet Horace, who you may know said, you can try to expel nature with a pitchfork, but it will always come back at you through the window. I say I was too optimistic about that. Although I think nature is on our side and nature does reassert itself, it's not fully self-enforcing or self-organizing when it comes to human civil society. 
Human civil society is not like an ant mound or a beehive uh, that comes into being by instinct alone, almost automatically, right? As Roger Scoot reminded us, the work of building up true civil society is hard, it takes time, it takes patience, it takes thought, and it's no simple matter to rebuild it if you tear it down uh, 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 wantonly in a fit of repudiation. So I can give a long uh, list of, uh, a reading list of good books and articles and authors to follow on these and other subjects. Uh, uh, but I keep being drawn back to one short, older book that I can never recommend highly enough. And, and it's a book written in 1944, long before the present troubles came into view, even in the distant horizon. And it's, it's C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man. Don't you know it by any chance? Uh, it's, it's only about 75 pages long. It's a little, it's, I won't say it's very, super difficult, but it's an elegantly written book and you have to spend some time reading it carefully and slowly, I think. Uh, and in that book, as I say, written late in World War II, uh, Lewis foresaw the earliest seeds of what would become unqualified moral relativism and nihilism. As I say, decades before it exploded into view. Nobody used the word postmodernism back then, but he described where, what it was, what it would become, uh, with uh, perfect clarity. And it's really quite astonishing. There's one sentence from the book I want to pick out and draw to your attention and comment on as a way to draw to a close here. He said this, and I'll read it twice. He said, a dogmatic belief in objective value is necessary to the very idea of a rule which is not a tyranny or an obedience which is not a slavery. There's a lot in that short sentence, a dogmatic belief in objective value, objective value, dogmatism, objective value, is necessary to the very idea of a rule which is not a tyranny or an obedience which is not slavery. I could go for a week on that sentence. I'll only go for five minutes, I promise. Um, I think it's quite profound, but on the surface, that sentence might seem contradictory, if not in fact shocking. Why dogmatic? a dogmatic exist, insistence on objective value. I mean, if moral truths have an objective basis in reason, that is the natural law tradition, why do they need to be dogmatic? And isn't dogmatism precisely what I'm accusing the new left of embracing and pushing on us? True. Now, I think the beginning explanation, or a beginning of an explanation of this can be found a lot of places, but I'd like to pick on a really unlikely place, and that's the Federalist Papers which uh, if you're familiar with American politics, it's the collection of essays written in 1787 to defend this brand new constitution and get it ratified by all the states. Uh, written by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton principally, also John Jay a bit. And those of you who may have studied American politics or history, you may have heard of Federalist 10, it's Madison's famous essays on faction, or the other one that's pretty well known as Federalist 51. That's the one where Madison says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And if we were governed by angels, we would need no restraints on government. But because men are not angels and we're not governed by, uh, uh, and we're not governed by angels, we need, free government needs to be limited government. That, by the way, is what Lewis has in mind, I think, with the idea of a rule which is not a tyranny we have to have rule and a government, or an obedience which is not slavery. Citizens need to have a reason to obey the laws and their rulers, even when their rulers make mistakes and when you don't vote for them. But there's a, a, a one of the papers in the Federalist that's almost always overlooked, including even by most American political scientists, is number 31. And it's worth looking up sometime. You can, of course, find it online very easily. And it's a paper that's about the taxing power in Article One, and right away you're about to fall asleep. Oh, wait, taxing power, who's, you know, good grief. And it was written by Hamilton. But the odd thing about this Federalist 31 is that Hamilton, before getting to the taxing power and how it should be understood, has about six paragraphs, very elegantly, elegantly written, on the premises of moral philosophy that I think could have been written by Thomas Aquinas. I'll just give a couple of sentences from it. Um, he says that um, we have certain, I'm quoting him now, we have primary truths or first principles upon which all subsequent reasonings must depend. These contain an internal evidence. 
which, antecedent to all reflection or combination, commands the assent of the human mind. And then he goes on to draw a parallel, much the way Lincoln did, to Euclidean geometry. You know, the proofs of the three sides of a triangle and two parallel lines of love or intersect, and, and the axioms of geometry. And, and what he points out is the nature of those geometric, geometrical axioms are grasped intuitively. You know, if you don't get it, well, you get an F in geometry. You know, it's just hard to explain to someone who doesn't get it. And he says moral truths work that way too. There are some moral truths that are true in and of themselves, or as Aquinas in fact did put it, per se nota, Latin, true in and of themselves, not requiring, you might say, scientific proof today. And Hamilton went on to say, where it produces not this effect, meaning the effect of the scent of the human mind to a primary truth, where it produces not this effect, it must proceed either from some defect or disorder in the organs of perception, or from the influence of some strong interest, passion, or prejudice." End quote. So today, the strong interest, passion, or prejudice of the leftist mind is the unlimited autonomy of the individual self, uh, uh, the, the, the utter rage for repudiation and destruction and tearing down of our civilization, uh, and, or any constraint imposed by human nature. And it's only a step from that unarticulated premise to the philosophy of unlimited government. And so that's why Lewis says that we have to have a dogmatic belief in objective value. I sometimes joke that, you know, you can't beat a dog with a stigma. You, you know, you need another dogma to go up against it, and it becomes a contest, ultimately of minds, that's the best way of doing the contest, but also of will. And, and so in other words, let me state it this way, uh, we need to be dogmatic because of the corruption of the leftist mind that more and more today rejects nature and reason and objectivity. So in other words, I think, I think it's right to say, uh, today the radical left exhibits a trained incapacity to think. And so dogmatism on the part of civilization's defenders is necessary lest civilization itself slip under the waves of nihilism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, you've given us a great deal to think about. And the first person who's going to think about it is, is Thomas Mangieri. Before I uh, enter, before I yield the microphone to you, Thomas, I did not mention in my earlier introduction to you the most important thing, which is you recently become the editor in chief both of the Hungarian Review and of the new magazine, which um, Steve was enthusing over uh, this weekend, uh, having read it, the new magazine, the Hungarian Conservative. The first issue was out a few months ago, the second is out, I think, this week. And uh, those of you who haven't read the magazine, I really recommend it to you. It's a, it, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a, a, a wonderful weekend's intellectual entertainment, as well as having a lot of the important objective truths that Steve has been talking about. Having said which, uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Uh, John uh, asked me to uh, make a couple of comments uh, on and uh, asked me to restrict myself to some 10 minutes or so, uh, which is a bit cruel because uh, at the university uh, I've got 90 minutes to uh, say whatever I want to say, so, but uh, really, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, that's my task. Um, so, uh, definitely uh, my comments will be unnecessarily sketchy. Uh, if I have to uh, give a title or subtitle uh, uh, to my uh, uh, brief uh, uh, contribution. Uh, it might be from Martin Luther King to George Floyd, uh, uh, somehow indicating the uh, intellectual progress uh, on uh, the uh, left, uh, uh, so to say. Uh, so, you know, first of all, I'd uh, like to start uh, very early uh, and uh, you don't have to be uh, scared because uh, I really want to uh, follow uh, the lead uh, from the beginning. Uh, uh, the, uh, most of the people for about 200 years uh, have been looking uh, at the US as uh, you know, a shining uh, city on the hill, uh, as a beacon. 
people flock to the United States uh, from Hungary and from all parts of the world uh, to study uh, the different institutions, uh, to learn um, how Americans were organizing their lives. Uh, uh, they were uh, looking at the uh, civil liberties uh, institutions as models. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, uh, this sort of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, pilgrimage uh, uh, came to an end in the 1960s. So I totally agree with uh, Mr. Hayward that the uh, uh, 1960s uh, uh, created a, a watershed uh, in this whole history. And if I want to be a little bit cynical, uh, I would say that uh, the the you know, United States, uh, after the Second World War, uh, had been exporting uh, all sorts of goodies to Europe uh, and uh, we returned them uh, in kind, uh, exporting uh, uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, Michel Foucault, uh, uh, and Paul de Vaughan. Uh, Paul de Vaughan was Belgian, by the way. Uh, uh, so, uh, all of these people who, uh, if you want to go to extremes, uh, uh, to a certain extent, corrupted innocence at home. I mean, uh, there was this Mark Twain uh, piece, uh, Innocence Abroad, about Americans visiting Europe. Uh, and I, I suppose, and I think that uh, Americans, uh, to a certain, certain extent, were innocent as compared to Simca Europeans in the 1960s. Uh, and all of these uh, philosophers, sociologists, uh, 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 people from uh, the Frankfurt School uh, and all the others uh, went to the universities uh, and uh, to start teaching uh, Marxism, neo-Marxism, leftism and so on. And at the same time uh, uh, they were coupled with, the, uh, uh, with this uh, romantic uh, uh, revolutionary spirit uh, uh, which uh, idolized people like uh, Mao Zedong uh, or Fidel Castro or Che Guevara and so on. And uh, I'm starting to see even a couple of people right now uh, donning uh, you know, uh, t-shirts with Che Guevara uh, 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 on the front. Uh, Mark Carvax is not so uh, it's not so in fashion, as you said, uh, uh, what I said with uh, Marx and Spencer, yeah, with Buzz Spencer's uh, <laughs> uh, image on the, uh, on the front of the, uh, on the uh, uh, t-shirt. Uh, so anyway, uh, what happened was that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the influx of the uh, French uh, and uh, German and other uh, philosophers uh, uh, was followed by uh, in the 1970s and 80s uh, a sort of a growing uh, uh, movement, uh, I would say, at uh, American colleges and universities, uh, the debunking of history uh, after deconstruction um, uh, and, uh, and talking about uh, the death uh, of uh, any values, uh, you cannot make any value judgment, uh, 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 one thing is as good as another one. Uh, so debunking history, the uh, heroization of history, uh, destroying the myth uh, in American history, uh, and relatively early in the 1980s, uh, Alan Bloom and the others uh, uh, put attention to the dangers inherent in these trends. Yeah, because uh, uh, even if you don't believe uh, all the myths in uh, from uh, Rex to Riches, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, uh, Lockheed into the White House and all of these uh, myths, but uh, they were very important to glue the nation together. And all of these, uh, these uh, debunking, the construction, the he uh, heroization, uh, uh, string the myth, uh, simply uh, eroded uh, all of the uh, the, uh, the elements which uh, uh, which uh, glued the nation together. So uh, simply, what started to happen in the 1970s and 80s was uh, the uh, so-called fragmentization of society. So parallel societies came into being. Martin Luther King uh, imagined the future of uh, uh, blacks, African Americans uh, uh, within the context of the American dream. Uh, uh, but even in the 1960s, you had the radical black movements uh, which wanted to, uh, to make a distinction between white and black culture, uh, the Black Panthers and all these radical uh, uh, movements. And, uh, and uh, for instance, uh, uh, there's a, a sort of uh, set continuity 
Uh, I remember 1968 Olympic Games uh, when uh, mm. uh, John Carlos and uh, Tommy uh, Smith, Smith. Yes, uh, uh, won the uh, 100 uh, uh, sprint and 200 sprint and uh, both of them were standing uh, on the first second place uh, with their hands, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with their fists uh, uh, raised high uh, and even I think uh, they were barefoot. Uh, uh, over there, and right now uh, I've read that uh, one of the athletes in the United States uh, uh, said that uh, if she yeah. uh, won, um, she would, I think, uh, burn the U.S. flag or whatever uh, she would be doing uh, to uh, to demonstrate against uh, uh, the country, uh, uh, which had uh, given her a lot of opportunities, uh, uh, given her uh, opportunities to compete, uh, uh, sending her uh, abroad uh, to compete for the uh, for the country. So uh, it seems to me that there is this uh, sort of continuity ever since then. Now, going back to the 1980s, uh, uh, it wasn't just Alan Blue uh, and the Leo uh, Strauss and the others who were calling about all of these problems, but even Arthur Schlesinger Jr., uh, yeah. who uh, was an icon on the uh, liberal side, uh, was writing a th slim book uh, uh, under the title of The Disuniting of, the, of America, or The Disuniting of the yeah. United States, can I remember? Uh, the second part of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the title, uh, again warning about the dire consequences uh, of all of these uh, uh, early identity movements. Uh, uh, when people started to buy uh, not into the American dream, but a lot of uh, uh, different dreams like the Americano dream. And uh, I, I don't suppose that it was a uh, uh, Boris uh, 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 coinage at that time, but uh, you know, talking about uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, influence, uh, uh, what uh, the influx of a uh, lot of people not sharing the American dream, the American creed uh, created in the United States. Now, um, um, going on uh, the, uh, uh, the 1980s, 19, uh, 90s, one of the, uh, the turning points or uh, the turning point was uh, the end of the Cold War. So uh, suddenly, uh, even that uh, national minimum, as, as far as the, uh, the, uh, uh, the foreign policy, foreign affairs uh, uh, was concerned, started to be eroded. Uh, so it was just you know, the Vietnam War, because after all that came Reagan. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, the Cold War, and uh, a lot of basic tenets were uh, questioned and uh, were challenged in the, in the United States. So, uh, it wasn't anymore uh, the, uh, the sort of country uh, that was uh, trying to attract the, uh, the, uh, uh, the admiration uh, of the American institutions, uh, at least uh, uh, the fight for the hearts and minds of the people uh, came to an end to a certain extent. Uh, end of history, this uh, sort of hubris uh, that uh, we should do anything uh, uh, in the future because we have won. Uh, I remember uh, our struggles in Hungary, uh, it was uh, absolutely hopeless to try to keep uh, uh, the United States information uh, agency information service uh, in Budapest, uh, which had quite a, uh, a nice library, uh, a video uh, collection, uh, magazines, uh, uh, film shows and so on. And the Clinton administration terminated it uh, together with the American houses in, in Germany, um, all over uh, uh, the world, uh, saying that uh, you know, the United States uh, didn't need any more uh, all of these institutions uh, because we had one. Uh, and uh, at a time when you have the Alliance Frances, uh, uh, the Goethe Institutes, uh, you have the, uh, the uh, uh, beautiful uh, Italian uh, culture center, Austrian culture center, Czech culture center, Slovak culture center, Polish, Polish culture center, and so on. Even the British Council uh, has some sort of operation over here, despite the fact that uh, they were moving parallelly. Now, um, I'd like to, to uh, conclude, uh, I think that uh, I am uh, overstaying my uh, welcome uh, to here. Uh, 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 John is uh, discreetly watching uh, uh, the watch. Uh, uh, I took a hint. So, uh, let's uh, uh, get to the present uh, uh, issue and, uh, and uh, 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 as
as an introduction, I said that they're from uh, uh, from Luther King to George Floyd. Uh, so instead of Lincoln, uh, instead of George Washington, uh, instead of uh, Frederick Douglass, instead of uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, instead of uh, Andrew Jackson, instead of all the heroes uh, of American history who made America great, uh, even if there were you know, uh, things which uh, uh, reading backward history uh, uh, weren't that nice. But uh, they were replaced by people like George Floyd. Uh, and uh, I've just read that, uh, that uh, a statue uh, was erected in Newark, uh, New Jersey. Uh, George Floyd has never set foot uh, uh, <laughs> to, to the state. Uh, and uh, renaming uh, all of these institutions, schools, uh, uh, destroying the past uh, and then you know, rewriting the past like the uh, 1619 project, you know, which is uh, a historian is uh, absolutely ridiculous and uh, and uh, and uh, a, 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 a front to history and offense to history. Yeah, so uh, I think that uh, this beacon role of the United States uh, uh, is slipping, and uh, the U.S. is not a, a beacon anymore to so many people all, all over the world, uh, which is, uh, uh, in the long run, uh, is counterproductive for the United States. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and this beacon sometimes is leading you to rocks. Uh, instead of uh, leading you away from rocks. Uh, and to conclude uh, this uh, short uh, contribution, um, let me be very personal. The only rocks uh, which I like are the rocks uh, in Scotch or in uh, Bourbon. Uh, uh, not real rocks. And, uh, I think that uh, the beacon should be restored in the original position. Uh, and, uh, and we should be very, very uh, uh, very what we import from the U.S. Uh, uh, and should be very, very selective. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank both the speakers for impressive performances and for giving us a very overall a very balanced and interesting picture of what's happened in America with also some forecasts of what they think will be happening in America in future. Um, this is one of many podcasts we'll be putting out in the next year, both about American events, but also about events in Europe. A whole series of elections, important elections, will be taking place this year in, in Germany, in France, in Italy. And, and those elections will have consequences not only for the countries concerned, but also, of course, for European politics in the European Assembly. So, um, May I invite you to return, uh, follow our podcasts um, on these and other topics, because I think we'll be giving you an intellectual feast on those occasions as well.